question for today, which is printed on the front of the bulletin, was offered by a member. I asked if you would like to offer questions, and some of the questions have been answered over the last few weeks, but the questions weren't as clear as this one, so I posted it right on the front. Why would God condemn millions of people to hell simply because they have never heard of them? If they've never heard of him, they've never had the chance to believe. Now, many good men and women and children have never had the opportunity to become official Christians. Um, so does God really turn his back on them? Is it enough that they are good and believe in a higher power? What I hear in this question is compassion. I hear an echo of God's compassion that this person doesn't want men and women and children to suffer in eternal anguish. And this is a question that people all through time have wrestled with it, and that's why it's answered in our scriptures. How wide are God's arms, and who is included in that embrace? Let's start with the Old Testament. Hear these voices of God's love for all people and all nations. Isaiah 40. The glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all people shall see it together. Isaiah 49. God promises, I will give you a light <coughs> to all nations that my salvation may reach the ends of the earth. Malachi 2. We have, are we not... All one in the Father? Has not one God created all of us? And we hear it as a repeated refrain in the Psalms. Today's Psalm 62 says, For God alone my soul waits in science for my silence, for my hope is from God. God alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be shaken. God, on God rests my deliverance. Voices from the New Testament, from 1 Timothy chapter 2. God desires everyone to be saved and to come to the knowledge of truth. And in 1 John 2, Jesus atoning sacrifice, not only for our sins, but for the sins of the world. These voices make it seem that God's love is all-encompassing, all-inclusive. But then you would say to me, oh, Pastor, what about John 14, 6, when Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one gets to me. No one gets to the Father except through me. And what about in Acts 4? Peter teaches there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among mortals by which we may be saved. <coughs> God's promise of eternal love seems to be both inclusive, open to all, and exclusive, open only to those who enter through Jesus. And that pushes me to ask, well, then how are people saved through Jesus? Is there something we have to do? Are there words that we have to say to show that we believe? Do we have to be good? John 3.16, a very familiar verse. So God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. That makes it sound like our salvation rests on our belief, something that we do. But then Ephesians 2 counters that. Listen to this. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, but a gift from God, not the results of work, so that anyone could boast. Our United Methodist traditions explain it this way. God's prevenient grace, God's love that comes before anything else, 
is always calling all of us to a life in Christ. And at some point, we choose to respond. We turn towards God. But our acceptance into that eternal life is not based on our goodness, but rather on Christ's goodness or righteousness, which is a good deal. Because our inability to consistently choose the right path has not, we're just not able to do that. We're never without, perfectly without sin. On our own, we can never be good enough. So through Christ's sacrifice on the cross, we are forgiven, redeemed from our sin, and brought back into that full relationship with God. Nothing blocks us between God and, eter and God's eternal love. Romans 3 states it this way, Since we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, we are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So now we have one image of salvation, our triune God issuing that invitation of love and us accepting it, and then we are welcomed into God's kingdom. That works for us, but what about others that the questioner has asked about? What about those who've never learned about Jesus? When Jesus was teaching and preaching, some man desperately wanted their paralyzed friend to be cured. So they wanted him to be restored for health. So they took him on a litter and they went, they forced their way through the crowds and they let that man down through the roof until he was right in front of Jesus. And Jesus said to him, he said, he saw their faith. Not necessarily the faith of the man. He saw the friend's faith and he said, take heart, son. Your sins are forgiven. And the man took up his bed, the thing that he was lowered through the roof, and he went home. The paralyzed man did nothing to earn salvation, no ceremony, no public declaration of belief, and yet was saved because his friends helped. Also listen to what happened to a short tax collector called Zacchaeus and his family. Zacchaeus went one day to see Jesus. He went and climbed up a tree to see the event of Jesus. And while he was there, Jesus saw him. He saw what was in Zacchaeus' heart and invited himself over to Zacchaeus' home, where at the end of the meal, he says, Today... Salvation has come to this house because he too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. It's an image of salvation for all through Jesus because Jesus came to seek and save. Jesus is doing the work. After Jesus says, I am the gate, whoever enters by me. He also says, I have other sheep who belong to this fold. I must bring them in also, and they will listen to my voice. We just don't know all the other sheep that Jesus is going to bring in. Consider the criminal hanging on the cross beside Jesus, who says, remember me when you come into the kingdom. And Jesus replies, today you will be with me in paradise. What had the criminal done? What had the criminal believed that made him deserve <coughs> entrance into heaven? God desires to bring all into heaven. Even while Jesus was dying on the cross with his last breaths, he spoke these words that revealed Jesus, God's sole reason for sending him to earth. Father, forgive them. 
in Luke 23. What sin could be greater than killing the Son of God? And if forgiveness and salvation are offered to that person, then God's arms reach much wider than we can suppose. In Isaiah 55, which tells of all nations, even ones that the Israelis haven't named or thought of coming to God. And it tells of God's abundant pardon. That passage reminds us that God's thoughts are not our thoughts. That God's can do things beyond the human imagination. Why would God create millions of people over thousands of years only to damn them, the majority of them, to hell? Does God have the power to get what God wants? Could God figure out a way to offer salvation to all? A 19th century poet, Frederick Faber, summarized the good news this way. There's a wildness in God's mercy, like the wideness of the sea. There's a kindness in God's justice, which is more than liberty. For the love of God is broader than the measure of our mind, and the heart of the eternal is most wonderfully kind. If our love were but more simple, we should rest upon God's word, and our lives would be illuminated by the presence of the Lord. Let's shift gears for one moment and look at this from a totally different angle. What are heaven and hell? Are they simply destinations after life? Or are we trying to describe the timing of God's reign? United Methodist tradition sees the kingdom of God, which we also call heaven, as both a present and a future reality. We can experience now the inbreaking of God's justice and mercy, like tasting a slice of heaven. We can be fully in God's eternal love when we die, and we continually hope for Christ's return and the full realization of God's reign on earth, like the Lord's Prayer says, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Our Bible study group says talk like this makes their brains hurt. Now and not yet. And if we can taste heaven now, can we also taste hell now? Last September, we talked about that great famine in the Horn of Africa, and, and we talked about the anguish of parents dying, parents holding their children while they died from thirst and hunger. And we saw video, and, and we saw pictures that made that <coughs> anguish, that desperation really clear to us, and then we went on our crop walk to raise money to help alleviate that. But could those people in that situation, which is ongoing even this week, are those people experiencing hell on earth? Ten cities have been built and food and medicine airlifted in, but it's not enough. People are still arriving Disease is still spreading among those that have stayed. What about situations closer to home? Right in our own backyard, right in Ferndale this week. As I listened to the winter relief guests and heard their life stories, I wondered if they weren't experiencing a slice of hell on earth right now. A chef who'd had 400 people working for him is injured, he can't work, he becomes homeless. A butcher who worked for Giant for more than 30 years had a stroke, put his house in his daughter's name, and lost access to his home. 
A pregnant woman, her house burned down only two weeks ago. The fire started in a neighboring townhouse, but engulfed all three homes. She'll have a home again, but right now, where is she? Could these folks be experiencing hell? Our loving God can't want people to suffer like this. Have you ever wondered why God even gives us salvation in the first place? God saves us and pulls at our hearts so that we can continually work and live fully in God's love. I don't think it's just like a checklist. Okay, when you say, check. People of Delmont say, check, 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 check. I don't think it works like that. I don't think he just does it because God can. I think that our transforming experience of divine acceptance and pardon leads us to participate in God's saving work. We can work with God to help draw others out of their hellish circumstances and into a taste of heaven. And when I spent the evenings at Ferndale this week, I experienced that inbreaking of God. And that's why I chose the artwork that's on the front cover of the bulletin. That inbreaking of God for me right now feels like rays of sun on a dark path. God rays in the food that warmed the bellies and nourished the winter relief guests. God rays in the promise of a safe place to sleep. A slice of heaven in the welcoming and caring hospitality of our church and of the church at Ferndale. By being God's mercy for them, they are temporarily lifted out of hell and into God's grace. Let's go back to that quote from Acts 4, where Peter declares the Jewish leaders, there is no salvation, there is salvation in no one else, for there is no name under heaven given among mortals by which we must be saved. In biblical terms, name means character, values, and the quality of person. Could it be that to be saved by the name of Jesus, it means to be saved by the character, the values, and the quality of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection? Or is it absolutely necessary to name the name? If we revisit that first question that we asked today, and then apply this logic, the question was, why would God condemn millions to hell because they had never learned the name of Jesus? Maybe the question ought to be, will we be the people through which God works? Will we help the millions out of hell by showing them the character, the values, and the personal life of Jesus? As Christians, People saved and striving for holiness in Christ, will we continue to address the famine in Africa? Can we alleviate the poverty and the famine of spirituality in the United States? Will we be Jesus for the homeless of Glen Burnie? Scripture says that God's salvation is open to all people. Do we have a heart to show others the way? Or will millions never know Jesus and be condemned? Amen.